Clerk, call the Operations Committee for May 8, 2023 together, please. We'll start with a prayer by Commissioner Allen, and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance by Chairman Anderson. Can we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity for us to serve the great citizens of Anderson County. And dear Lord, give us the wisdom to conduct the people's business according to your will, and let us be slow to speak and quick to listen. These things I pray, amen. Amen. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Next is the approval of the agenda. Second. We've got a motion and a second. Uh, Chairman Anderson. So we had under new business uh, discussion of uh, additional uh, pans at the uh, convenience center. Yes, sir. Additional what? Uh, what do you, the, the, the containers. Over, overflow containers. Oh, overflow yeah. containers, yeah. It's like the 30 yard containers just for overflow. Is that okay with make for the motion and second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Next is appearance of citizens for anything that's not on the agenda. I haven't seen anyone. Uh, next is the mayor's report. Good evening, commissioners. Um, the first item on the agenda is a resolution 2305-1090 this resolution is requesting that the information technology department take certain actions and create policies related to national and state identified cybersecurity risk around the use of TikTok on government equipment that's anderson county government owned equipment and systems um, this resolution was requested by commissioner yeager um, it is modeled after a memphis resolution uh, you will note in the resolution it is very much a bipartisan resolution. You have everyone from President Biden to Senator Hawley to Governor Lee all taking steps to secure government systems um, from TikTok. Something else that um, is also very, I, I won't read the entire resolution unless you all want me to, but um, a few things just of note, especially for folks at home. Um, the, it does note that the Board of Commissioners fervently believes that the vast majority of our employees do not engage in improper use of county issued devices. And this resolution is in no way to be viewed as punitive, rather it is a security measure for the safety and protection of county employees, Anderson County government and the citizens of Anderson County. And then it also in the be it resolved, um, the Board of Commissioners request that the county's information technology department um, develop their own through the committee policies and procedures to provide for public safety and cybersecurity exemptions related to TikTok. So, you know, this will be IT doing this, but this is um, on you know government devices, but then also policies um, related to that. So, Commissioner Mays, move to approve. Okay, second. A motion and second discussion. I have a quick question. Commissioner. Uh, do the committee, Commissioner Yeager, I know, that, and this may be for the mayor too, but did the committee consider if there are any kind of, not ramification, I don't know what the right word is, but law enforcement, do they utilize this tool at all in terms of, I know there's a messaging feature, and then if someone's posting videos or anything like that, has that been looked at in terms of is that a tool that we're taking away or just curious the way i understand it is um this i believe were you at the meeting for the it committee for this oh you probably were in. yeah we, we were i believe there. it passed unanimously it did there was an improper motion and so they had to um pull back on that and they will take it up at the next meeting 
It, it wasn't unanimous, actually. I mean, it do, it, none of it was recorded. Okay. I actually voted no only because what I expressed to the committee is if we are going to take such action, we need something in writing that notes that, the, you know, not just a vote of committee, but we needed documentation that there are cybersecurity okay. concerns. And so mine was more procedural. And then by the time we had that meeting, then Governor Lee put his own mm -hmm. Uh, cyber alert out there and so I, I believe I know the a lot of departments use Facebook but I don't know if any of them use TikTok as a means of communication to you I I, I do not I don't know yeah. but I, I will say to your point um, and Commissioner Yeager did bring this up with regard to um, the exemptions there are exemptions in that item four so it says to develop a policy and procedure for public safety and cybersecurity exemptions related to TikTok. So under that exemption, obviously I think law enforcement it's if something they're they can using, work on and work yes, out. if okay. they're using it for investigations and I know they they capture a lot via TikTok. So yeah. Yeah. thank you so much. Yep. Stephanie. Yeah. there was any departments we actually use TikTok for promotion um so i know and we we're talking about you know creating a policy then i'll definitely talk to brian about it and we want to follow we don't you know we do not want any breach of networks on tourism behalf we do have a separate network and we usually use our mobile devices because it's just a lot easier to do it that way but we are using TikTok for promotional okay. purposes right. so one other item is um, I was asking our IT director, and he said the biggest danger of corrupting the county system is through our county Wi-Fi. So that would be also uh, taken under advisement on how to, how to work through that too. Anything else? Nothing from me. Uh, motion by Commissioner May, second by Commissioner Yeager. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Okay, uh, the next is another action item request. I'm requesting a motion to approve the special permit with the Tennessee Department of Transportation for the use of state property to install and maintain landscaping. This request is related to the Veterans Bridge flagpole project that we've been working on for quite a while. Um, what TDOT did is they separated the um, the landscaping from the flagpoles themselves. They are uh, their committee has recommended that um, we get a license for the flagpoles, but that's not final. It's pending a survey of the boundaries and all of that. So that will be next phase. Uh, we did put a completion date by November 30th, 2025 on there just to make sure, because you never know anything uh, transportation related may take a while so I, I just thought why come back and amend something just put that date out there a little bit further and we have a motion by Commissioner McCamey second second by Commissioner Yeager any discussion I know this is gonna make Commissioner Wandell happy uh, all in favor Aye. any opposed motion passes unanimous all right, the next item is um, assignment of courthouse space. It is the responsibility of the Board of Commissioners to assign space for government operations. Currently, IT occupies and is assigned via a motion of, of this body through the full commission. Rooms 26, 27, 25, and 24, those are at the rear of the Planning and Development Office. That's known as Office 127. Um, the Office of Finance and Purchasing occupies offices 214, 216, and 218. Um, IT is requesting to move up to that um, purchasing space. So they would occupy 216 and 218. So that the motion is to authorize the reassignment of space to IT to rooms 216 and 218 and the reversion of rooms 26, 27, 25, and 24 to the Planning and Development Department. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner <clears throat> McCamey, seconded by Commissioner Yeager. Discussion? Uh, I spoke with Brian myself this afternoon. He couldn't be here, but he said he was in favor of that. 
All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. The next is approval of railroad agreement project pin number 125540.04. This is miscellaneous safety improvements near Oliver Springs, Tennessee. Um, I, I just kind of highlighted that the primary notes on county cooperation are noted on page six. I did reach out to the highway department and Mr. Long, uh, Sally communicated with TDOT and then she sent me a message that they've reviewed everything and that Gary Long was good with this. He had no issues, so we're recommending approval. So moved. Second. Have a motion by Commissioner Allen, seconded by Commissioner Mays. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. The next is I'm requesting a motion to convert to confirm Anderson County's intent to renew a license agreement with TDOT for sidewalks along State Route 116 from log mile 15.43 to log mile 15.59 15 and in your agenda packet was uh, the former agreement going back to 2012 and these are by the Bryceville Elementary School. The so, sidewalks are already in place. Yes. Motion by Commissioner McCamey. Seconded by Commissioner Allen. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Okay, the next is a, uh, I am requesting approval of resolution 2305-1091. This would give the Anderson County Mayor um, and the delinquent tax attorney the authority to file for relief with the court system on a property purchased at a tax sale. Um, uh, TCA there have been some changes in the state law it allows us within 120 days of a delinquent tax sale to review certain properties for liabilities where the liability would outweigh um, the value of the property in this particular case um, with one of the properties there are more than just the single parcel itself there are other liabilities associated with ownership and that is um, in your agenda packet is 118 Duke Street. And this authorization would, um, if you are in agreement, would allow us, uh, the delinquent tax attorney would then file with the court that um, that property would not come into Anderson County's hands um, once that 12, there's 12 month redemption period. Um, I will note that the law director has indicated that the prior owner has said he intends to redeem, but if he does not redeem, then I want to make sure that we have the safeguards in place not to accept this property. So I'm, I'm requesting this approval. So moved. Was that Commissioner Ager on the second? Commissioner Allen. Commissioner Mason, Commissioner Allen, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Okay, um, the, the next item is, this is the length of service award uh, program. Um, I had brought this to your attention, I think last month, and you authorized me to work on this, and so I did work with uh, the state of Tennessee Treasury Department to get that final version that is in your package. Um, the main things, or I guess the three critical points about the documents that will differ from county to county are your forfeiture terms. And what that means is um, if the county makes a contribution on behalf of a, vol a volunteer, um, what do we want those forfeiture terms to look like? And what that means is the money will come back to Anderson County if um, the volunteer is not properly vested. And so what I proposed for you all was um, if a volunteer was out of service for three years. Um, the next eligibility criteria was a proposed point system. And in talking with Treasury, just so that you all know, 
the eligibility criteria can be amended by you all at any point in the future. So if you find out, you know, maybe it's too stringent or maybe it's too loose, um, you all through an amendment process can amend this plan with the Treasury Department. There's no, you know, once you pass it, it's not locked in for life. So just to make you aware of that. And um, so Appendix A in your package, I, I sent that out um, via email and also gave that out tonight. The volunteer must earn 50 points in a calendar year to be eligible for a contribution. And one hour, I mean, one point per hour of training, one point per hour of drill, one point per hour of a mandatory meeting, and a volunteer could earn up to 35 points that way. Um, volunteers may earn up to 40 points for participation in any response scenario and you'll see the different points there. So, um, you know, we tried, I've seen, I saw Roan County's version as an example, um, is a little stricter, and I think this gives volunteers um, more opportunity to, to receive a contribution, which I think accomplishes the goal of this program, which is to encourage people to be volunteers, um, you know, to recruit them, to retain them and you know if you find maybe this is a little too liberal or, or generous uh, maybe you you know tighten it up but I think it gives you know 40 points 75 or 35 points it gives them a way to cobble together the points necessary for a co contribution um, and then the third um, is your contribution guide this is not a requirement by the state of Tennessee. You only have to, um, you know, commit, set the program up, and then agree to make an annual contribution, which is made in December. Um, but based on the discussion taking place at this committee, you all discussed, is there a way to perhaps contribute more to volunteers who have longer years of service? And so that's what this document is that proposed three. And this was just something to start. And, and again, it can be amended. You all could change it tonight. Um, but for this contribution guide, um, you would have a base contribution. The minimum contribution the state of Tennessee requires is $200 per volunteer. But if you all chose to adopt this contribution guide, if someone has served six to 10 years, you could you know, I'm just proposing there, you double the contribution. Then times three, times four, times five, going up to 21 years and, and greater. And that's just based on your all's input, but that, you know, that's not a requirement. Um, if you're not comfortable with that or if you wanna work on that longer, I don't even think that has to be approved even tonight to get the program started and to sign the plan documents in the, the resolution you know, you all could continue to work on it or you could go ahead and adopt that one. And I'll, I'll be quiet and then <laughs> let you all ask away. Has there been any back testing of how many would be eligible on a, you know, over the, over the past five-ish years or something like that? Um, no, all I know, and I was talking <laughs> with Commissioner Barron about this, um, Looking back like at the, I guess a year ago when we were seeing how many volunteers do we have out there in our departments, the number at that time was 141. So I just used that to say, what if every single one of them received it and we started with the $200? Uh, I mean, we're looking at about $28,000. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we may not, you know, I don't know what department might like to adopt it because just because we sign up to participate does not necessarily mean one of the departments may want to track the meetings, track yeah, the, yeah. you know, track the response times. You know, I don't know. And I also don't know from a participation standpoint, you know, they may turn in, so they have to turn in to the mayor's office 
um, you know, we have 28 volunteers in our department, but it doesn't tell me, are they active volunteers? Are they, you know, once every few months? Or are they there at the fire hall? Or are they always the, the person I can count on? So I really don't know. Okay. I do know that um, one of the things I, I did get some clarification on, I shared with you all that if we put something in place, there is a grant that opens up July 1 and for $5,000 for us to make contributions to the departments or to the volunteers. I did clarify that that is for each separate department. So um, if they want to be a participant, each department would have the eligibility for $5,000 through us. Okay. So. Commissioner Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so on the compliance and reporting, will that be someone in each department or will there be a person? So it says the employer is solely responsible for complying with the terms of the plan and um, keeping up with all of the eligibility and who will do that? So each department will have to be responsible for turning that in to Anderson County. Okay. Medford yeah. tracks that now. They yes. do. They okay. Do. That's standard business. And so then the money that the county puts in, where will that come from? Um, so that would be our commitment would our be. Commitment. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then we have to pay, if I understood this correctly, $500 to set it up? Yes. Is that per department or just? Her. Just a one-time setup fee. Okay. Yes. And then each participant has to pay twelve dollars to be a part of it. Is that I, correct? I think that is so. That would be our commitment for how many participants we would have. Okay. Um, that was my understanding, and I can double check that. Double check that, Commissioner Palmer. Okay. All right. And so, uh, if I read this correctly, also six thousand is the maximum. Two hundred is the base. Correct. Six thousand is the max. Yes. And then, was there a particular reason why three years was chosen for the forfeiture? Um, honestly, I just chose the middle path. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I, know uh, I, I know Roan County. I think um, made it a, a little more stringent. Yeah. yeah. And then there is one that's um, also two years, which I thought, you know, say someone serves in the military mm -hmm. or has a health issue and they step away. I was just thinking that was my mindset was be a little more generous with what happens in someone's life or they have a baby, you know, that's born and they sure. have to step away for, for a little bit longer. Right. So. Okay. All right. I think that was all. Um, it also talked about, um, I think this was on page three, this contractor, this agreement, um, about the, that we have evaluated the risk and the merits of this. Are there any risk? Have we thought about that? What, what would be the risk with putting a plan like this in place? Um, you know, uh, to me, the only risk is, um, you know, if you want to fund it or not. Um, but I, I don't, we cannot, the, the reason the state of Tennessee put this in place is we can't, as a local government, make a financial contribution to each volunteer. We're right. prohibited via right. I, IRS standards. Um, I guess the risk would be if we want to stop contributing and then there's right. negative um, feedback from the volunteer fire departments if we no longer want to maintain the commitment but i don't see okay a, um you know a big a big risk um maybe if we um don't properly ask for the right you know if we just don't put in place a nice policy to make sure we're getting mm -hmm. the information from the chief and or a compliance officer with a, a local department right. and we just say hey we're going to make a contribution and we don't keep the proper paperwork right and uh, so it's kind of like we there's this fund out there this pool and we're putting into that pool yes correct? <coughs> this is so. the same fund that's um, retirement for county mm -hmm. employees okay. um, the volunteers would have access to the state website just like if they were 
457 plan or TCRS, okay. Tennessee okay. Co Consolidated Retirement, they could watch their money. Okay. So we're probably just not far enough ahead to work out all those little details. Right. Okay. Commissioner McCain. Mayor, all through this resolution, it talks about eligible employers. Yes. We don't employ any of the volunteer fire departments. So, so we, what's the definition of eligible employer? The, so we are considered the eligible employer. Mm -hmm. Anderson County government is. Even though none of the fire departments participate in any other county program, they're not county employees. Correct. A county employee in the fire department. Correct. So we just we are considered. This is how the state of Tennessee set this up. We are considered the eligible employer, and I guess it has to do with their whole plan document with Treasury, their trust agreement. Um, for purposes of enacting this law, we are the eligible employer. Yeah, okay. and I think if, if you so Treasury actually put this together, um, this document, and um, where is it? I'm sorry, Commissioner McCamey, I can't find what I'm looking for. Well, never mind. I can't find what I'm looking for. Well, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have to employ somebody in the fire department in order to be considered an employer. No. I mean, it's all strictly volunteer. They have their own rules and regulations, and we, we can't tell them what to do or not what to do. I, I just don't see how we can be considered an employer. So that's, um, you know, their lawyers at the state of Tennessee, that's their wording to allow this program. And so, for instance, if you look at that el eligibility criteria page, the Appendix A, that is their language. So um, I just suggested the points, but if you'll notice, like, for instance, 40 points for participation in 20% or more of the calls at a single eligible employer. And then the parentheses, that's theirs. Anderson County Volunteer Fire Department or Rescue Squad. So they're spelling out, it's any, you know, we're, we're the entity that's setting up the fund and the account. We're going to be responsible for, um, you know, making sure that each department, when they submit their list, here's our eligible volunteers, then we keep that paperwork but it, it's for any Anderson County Volunteer Fire Department or Rescue Squad. Okay. Commissioner Mays, did you want to? Yeah, come um, up? how much does Brown County contribute annually? You may have said this, I apologize. I don't know. I don't know that I have what their, I don't have their contribution level. I just had their agreement and then um, their eligibility criteria. Has the finance director thrown out a number in terms of what he thinks may be appropriate or anything like that? No, he is not. And I mean, you know, my hope was that you just get it off the ground and start minimal. And then if we're eligible for the grants, um, that is a great benefit for for starting and even if it's even if you maintain a commitment to even two hundred dollars it's two hundred dollars that a volunteer did not have and um, Do we will we enter into a contractual agreement with the agency once that this goes through for I guess for me like the reporting process of, I would like it to, you know, to make sure that the chief of that department is the one who signs off on the reporting aspect to the to the county okay like okay. If, so i don't know if there's like a 
an agreement that we have to or an MOU or anything like that is that part of do we have to do that or um, I think that's a good idea I, I, it's not required as right, part okay. of this agreement to stand up the account um, but I think that's a good idea we could definitely do that we could come back uh, with that mr. chairman I would um, so we can continue discussion or but I would like to make a motion that we approve the agreement tonight as it's written then um, as the mayor said that gives us opportunity to continue to discuss and and add to take away or whatever the the case is but that way we can go ahead and get it established and and move forward second um, most made by Commissioner May seen by Commissioner McCain and Commissioner Allen uh, and I, I did chat with um, Commissioner Wandell as he is chairman of fire commission and I do think that um, fire commission would want to weigh into on how that communication takes place and um, you know who to your point who's managing that um, who wants to manage it and what would that management look like yeah that's awesome thank you so much anybody else one of the things I look at it being on the Medford volunteer fire department board for quite some time is you always look for volunteers and this is an annual thing so you've got somebody there's been there for 20 years and I know we got at least two maybe three that's a retirement package when you get it six thousand dollars a month um, a year I'm sorry six thousand dollars a year that's, that's pretty good uh, for retirement and that's you know that's something that people can plan for by being a member of the volunteer fire departments so I think it's an excellent recruiting tool anything else all in favor aye any opposed motion passes unanimous and that's all I have all directors report Hey, Jay, I think they've got some maps if you want to pass them out. This is Mr. Crutchfield. Here's a surveyor. But what we've got is some remnants along 25W inside the city limits of Rocky Top that was deeded to the county back in 1933 and 1934. We don't have property tax identifier numbers, map and parcels on them or not. We believe the remnants left from the build of the 25W and probably part, part of that. But anyway, Powell Clinch uh, <laughs> needs those to clean up their title and their survey to their property. Uh, the maintenance uh, facility just north of the creek there will be um, sold at auction. Mr. So, <laughs> so that's what's going on. I'll let, I'll let Mr. Crutchfield explain it to you more. But we're taking some. Um, ultimately, we're taking a little bit of property that we've got left over from the reconstruction of 25W. And putting it back on the tax rolls. Mr. Crutchfield, you want to explain it and maybe fill in the holes better than I can? Yeah. The, uh, <coughs> what we discovered, uh, I, I was retained by Powell Clinch to survey off the property that they now want to sell. That's the area that's located on the opposite side of the creek from where their uh, main office facility is in, in Rocky Top. What, we, what I discovered when we were uh, preparing the survey for this is that back in the 1920s, uh, Anderson County had acquired several dozen parcels of land to build what was then called the Dixie Highway, uh, which is US Highway 25W, which, which turns into Main Street that goes through Rocky Top now. And in some of these deeds, they acquired more property than they were actually using in terms of where the actual uh, roadway is located. And what we discovered in this particular instance was that Powell Clinch's property abuts some of that excess right of way that Anderson County had acquired at that time. It's that dotted line that you see right here in the corner. Correct. Um, and th the reason that it became an issue was that this additional right of way became an encumbrance on that existing building. So 
So uh, we decided in this instance that the best way to handle this would be to, since, since that's excess right of way that's not being used, it probably will never be used, and it was deeded to Anderson County, that the best thing to do would be to approach Anderson County and see if they would quit claiming it back to Powell Clinch so that we could remove that encumbrance and the property could be sold and the building could be sold without the encumbrance on it. You, uh, you've got, on the quick claim deed draft, you've got three exhibits. There you've got the two deeds where we acquired the property, 33 and 34. And um, you've got another one that's got the aerial view and it's pointing out the subject property. That's what we're dealing with. That helps any of them. I do just have a couple of questions. Um, one is, I know Powell Clinch is a quasi-government agency, but my question is if we have the ability to just quit claim this at no cost or $10, um, or if, it, if we have to, I'm not opposed to this by any stretch, but do we, do we have that legal ability? Um, yeah, so, for instance, when we gave property to Emory Valley Center, we had to get an exception. We had to get a request a private act and to be able to direct it directly to them and not go through the surplus and the auction scenario. And if not, maybe that is a way when they go to sell it. It can also be fair market value. Yeah, something like that. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just asking the legal question about how we can make that happen and if that is, is permissible. To answer a question, the Emory Valley Center was a not-for-profit. Kyle Clinch is a utility district uh, registered by the Secretary of State. Um, there is a question I had at one point is if you want to run this through the surplus uh, through the Purchasing Commission, but it was deeded to us years ago. and. Um, we didn't even know we had it. We don't even have a map and parcel assigned to it or anything like that. But um, you have, you're welcome to run it through the purchasing committee and declare it surplus, but uh, it's a small remnant there is all it is. Bear's got one from the 20s, wasn't it? <clears throat> this property was actually deeded to Anderson County in 1926. And he's got that parcel that, yeah, it's. Well, I've, yeah. I've got the two deeds that we pulled today, Bear. I'm, the row deed is, is that 26 or 36, whatever the case may be. It's 26. Does anybody, can anybody tell? The map that I have from the statistics <coughs> shows it. It was, it was done in the mid-20s. A lot yeah, of these it may be. Were, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's all right. It looks like down here at the bottom it may be a two. But that's no problem. We can uh, change that. The only place it's uh, embedded in the document is uh, the derivative clause, derivation clause. Um, we can fix that. I've got it recorded March 3rd, 33, and June 3rd, 34 on the draft. I might add that some of these, what we saw was that when you look at a lot of these deeds, they may have been dated in the mid-20s. Some of them didn't even file until later, and that may be where that's where that's coming from. The T dot map that they gave us and gave me during the course of the survey work was dated I think 1925 and later uh, revised 1927. So those are the dates that, that I have been using on that. Um, Quick question for Jay. Yes, um, sir. Jay, you mentioned that you thought about the purchasing process. What is your, I mean, do you think that's what we need to do, or do you think? I would probably recommend just declaring it surplus and moving forward like that way because it is, in a sense, even though we didn't know we had it and we don't have it on a map and parcel, it is a county asset. Um, but long before the 57 Act and 81 Act was ever uh, approved by the General Assembly, but we can run it through um, purchasing pretty quick.
Mr. McCain. If we if we do that, then do we have to auction it? If I don't think so. Um, I'll make sure we don't have to, uh, but I'll, I'll look at that closely. Well, I'd hate to <laughs> do that and then, mm -hmm. you know, have somebody come up. And Let me do a little bit of research on that issue for you. Outlandish um, amount, just to. Mm -hmm. Would a deferral just motion make sense then? Sure. What is the time frame with Kyle Clinch? I well, trying to do it in a couple of months, but the problem was what they sent me had a legal description that included both uh, a deed from Rocky Top City and also from the state of Tennessee. I can't do that. So I explained to Mr. Crutchfield and the folks from Powell Clinch, it's probably going to take a few months to get that from TDOT. They're not real fast on turnaround, that kind of stuff. Um, and um, we'll have to get Rocky Top. They've got new legal counsel up there to do their portion. So before it can ever be sold, do you have a tentative date of your auction? As soon as it gets cleared up. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's surplus property. Mm -hmm. Will um. So would a motion of referral be to purchasing be appropriate? Purchasing. In the meantime, I'll I'll get the legal research together for you. Mr. Chairman, I'll just make a motion to refer to purchasing uh, while the the law director researches. Is that second, Commissioner yes. Palmer? Motion made by Commissioner May, seconded by Commissioner Palmer. Defer to uh, purchasing next month. Mm -hmm. Be the second Monday of the month at 4.30. Any other questions on this? That's all I have for you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. <coughs> Next is EMS discussion by Commissioner Mays. Thank y'all coming. Thank y'all for coming from Thank Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just, and I'm sure you've gotten some emails from Claxton. There's been some, and this is not the reason why I'm having a discussion about EMS, uh, because what I would like to talk about some more is your locations. You know, I've been talking about I want to build in Claxton, I want to move Station One. Yes. Um, and I think sometimes in the community, EMS, you and your staff get a bad rap for response time when really I think it's the people up here who decide what kind of response time our citizens get. Correct. Um, so, A, I would like to just know where you're at on the station movings. Um, and two, just at some point, I know that this committee is not budget doesn't control the purse strings, but I just think at some point uh, our citizens deserve to to know kind of where we stand um, with EMS and um, to help you. I mean, you've made your pitch, your eight to eight time frames, you've all the needs that you have. Uh, but for the discussion for operations, I would just have we moved the needle at all on station one coming over the bridge and then two ask that we either you may already have it or that we that we request that you put together um, you know a, a proposal or a plan that shows as close as you can get the cost of building a station in in district one including equipment building personnel the whole nine um just because i think that you know you talked about earlier that you're you like to look at long term um and i think that 
in the long term, there's no doubt that this commission has to address that area uh, when it comes to EMS response times because you guys are working yourself, you know, insane. And unfortunately, you're the ones that are getting the letters and the emails and um, when you all are just doing the, the very best that you can. And so uh, I'd just be curious to know where we're at on that on the station relocation yes. and then also the discussion of um, a new facility yeah so uh, that was multiple questions in one so if I forget one please remind me uh, and it's it is nice to see everyone a little bit more lively compared <laughs> to the purchasing committee uh, I attribute that to director McCamey being here he uh, does but, he brings the spirits up yes he does he does but uh, so really to answer your question has the needle moved no it has not um, I cannot say that I've actively looked for property I have driven the area I was like oh that looks nice um, but I haven't pursued that uh, we did make a request in the budget that I submitted to add a seventh daytime ambulance um, I did put in capital outlay the request of building a new station now I can't say that that was the Claxton station that you've referenced um, but we haven't even gotten to capital outlay in the budget process uh, budget committee last week did not approve the seventh ambulance uh, so right now the budget process is for us to stay staffed as we are today uh, so with with us moving to South Clinton for our Clinton uh, truck from from the jail to South Clinton to help with that um, really did piggyback off of having a, a day truck because our Clinton ambulance is the ambulance that moves the most whether it's for a call or for posting it moves the most so putting that truck in South Clinton without the extra day truck technically if they're in quarters they're going to be closer the response is going to be much quicker but considering they're the busiest truck as far as movement goes that means they're going to be out of quarters more frequently than some others um, so moving our our truck there it, it will help at times obviously will help at times because they'll be in quarters um, the the biggest impact would be with a with an additional day truck that we were going to have in Clinton um, so that would help with that availability um, because obviously our our level zero code white events are still occurring uh, they're still going to occur uh, Claxton is one of those areas you know I, I did get an email and that reminds me because I need to respond to to uh, person emailed um, without getting details of a specific response I don't know what kind of limitations there might have been um, I know that they, they had questions about a 20-minute response time I did look at the day prior to and I saw a response time was actually 14 minutes um, that it took from the Oak Ridge truck who was coming from quarters to get to the, the to the call and it was a 14 minute response time but there are certain areas of our county um, New River Highway I mean especially you get up towards the county line you're literally talking 40 minutes because while I can get in and out on New River Highway I'll, I'll be green by the time I'm done with motion sickness but even in my Explorer you just can't travel fast on that road um, so there are still some limitations we will always face uh, but that's you know New River Highway has a less frequent call volume than Claxton does uh, so I, I do I still anticipate with growth of the county if it continues this trend um, that we're going to consider having to add a seventh 24-hour truck but no better way to start that when you go ahead and get the first half the seventh day truck uh, so honestly uh, we've talked about it um, we've got a study done we've presented it um, we've taken a look mayor and I have had multiple discussions kind of bouncing ideas back and forth we keep discussing it looking at it um, County Commission really has to be the one to kind of decide if they want to move that needle or not was the was the vote last week they just didn't vote on it or did they deny it they voted to go with option three which was to not change our our current plan and it was a unanimous vote okay um, and mr. chairman if I may I mean this 
I think this is, it, it speaks to a larger issue in this county, and I mean facilities. Currently, EMS has facilities that are, are just not up to par. Um, and that's the case for, a, I'm not just singling EMS out, but across the board, um, this, I think this body, uh, and I know that I will, really needs to start looking at our facilities as a whole. Um, our new, one of our newest buildings is probably this courthouse, to be honest with you. We have some nice little small things here and there. But we have facilities that honestly need to be bulldozed down and probably auctioned off when you think about the drug, old drug building right here in downtown Clinton. That place right there is just a, a standing liability. Um, we've got facilities like that all across this county. I know things cost money, but at some point, I mean, we're going to, you know, kick the can down the road, and I just don't think that that's our responsibility as a commission uh, to do that. I would like to see, and I, I guess we have a facilities committee. Uh, I don't even know if it addresses this these issues, or is that more of an internal issue, you know, where they need to, I don't know, I just need some guidance there, but um, at, at some point as a county, I mean, we, it is, we can blame Nathan, we can blame Russell, we can blame all these people all we want, but guys, this is, we're the one who funds them, and if we're not, <coughs> if we're not even going to give them uh, enough coverage uh, that is bare minimum that, that they've asked for, you know, uh, I just, I just, I don't know what the purpose is. Uh, but I would like, and, and again, I would defer to Commissioner McCain, or you guys have been here, you were more knowledgeable about it, but how can we really start looking at these facilities, his facilities, getting him better space, getting him better, uh, getting him in better situations. I mean, the contract that we approved in purchasing today, we all did it with our, you know, holding our nose because we didn't really like it, but that's just really kind of where he's at. Uh, this is kind of the, the way the cookie crumbles right now. Uh, but <coughs> at what point are we going to stop worrying about reelection or stop worrying about all of these other things and start doing what's right for these people who provide the daily services for our citizens. Um, you know, I'm not advocating for any kind of, you know, financial change in taxes or anything like that up here. But, I mean, we just got to put everything on the table. And if we truly want to offer these citizens uh, the best services, especially in public safety, I mean, it's one of our number one priorities is to keep people safe in this community. Uh, I would just ask for guidance on where do we go to really start kind of moving the needle and moving forward rather than just discussing it. Because something's gonna have to give um, across the board. Uh, Commissioner Mays, do you think we need some kind of study or to, to, to look at these facilities carefully to make some kind of I mean, I would. Needle. I mean, with all due respect, to, and I'm saying this because heck, my father-in-law served. <laughs> this county has paid more money in studies and observations than I would even like to admit, and most of them we don't even follow. Well, what do you think we should do? That's, that's my, my my question is 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 start funding the needs of these de these departments, <laughs> and start finding out ways to fund these folks, and start real you know. Um, Start getting a little creative where they're, you know, it's getting things off our tax roll and getting things back, you know, uh, putting things back on, you know, the tax base. Again, I used downtown Clinton as an example. Yeah. I wouldn't let anybody in there uh, with a, even with a hazmat suit. It's awful. And that's not the only facility we have that's like that. And that's embarrassing. We, I drive this state almost every week. And for... While we have great services, our facilities are just not where they need to be. And that is, that's just really unfortunate. 
you know. Uh, so I would just ask for guidance. I'm happy to lead the charge, even if I'm, you know, lone wolf. I'm. I. I, I just think it's so imperative that we look at these and not keep pushing these things down the road and, and not get into these agreements and these. I mean, when I look at your facility, it reminds me of the General Sessions Court that we paid on in Oak Ridge for so long. That place was a dump, and we paid I don't know how much money to renovate property that weren't even yours that now you can get a taco at. And it's just frustrating um, to, for that to happen. So I would just ask for guidance on where we can go from there. Commissioner McCamey, before Commissioner Allen, after he gets done, we can, if, if he don't answer your question, but we've been through this before, but go ahead, Commissioner McCamey. Yeah. Well, the budget committee didn't recommend the 12 hour club, but that doesn't mean it's dead. Right. You know, we get to vote on the entire budget, and we can add or take away from anything. Would the eight hour or 12 hour, right? Yes, sir. You're saying 12 hour truck mm -hmm. instead of eight hour. Uh, could it be stationed in the Claxton community? I know we used to have standby at the Claxton Fire Department. I, I believe they demolished that facility. Oh, they the did? The Claxton Fire Department right next to the school. Yeah. Yeah, they, they tore down most of that facility. There's a, there's a small part, part of it, I think, that's still standing, but I believe that's uh, I'm not sure what they are using that facility for. So technically, can we post it there? Yes. Can we station it there? No, we don't have a facility to put it in. Um, so, I mean, so technically, could we post it there? Yes, but that, that's not the most ideal uh, situation. You know, having somewhere they can get out and, and go to uh, within their zone is, is an ideal. Now, I have not talked with, with Chief Sharp for Claxton and see if there's any room at his uh, facility for our crew to, to get out and, you know, when they do have a moment to, to be there and have a restroom facility and so on and so forth. We wouldn't need beds, obviously, uh, because they wouldn't be staffed at night. And then it would come back to our location in, in Clinton for the evening time after shift, it would come and be housed there. So it wouldn't have to be housed on their property. So possible, but I would have to, I mean, I, I can't speak for Claxton Well, I'm Fire. not too wild about moving the Clinton station just across the bridge. Uh, when the Rocky Top unit goes toward New River, they're going to be gone for two hours. And that leaves Norris, Andersonville, <laughs> Fairview, Rocky Top, open for Clinton. Clinton has to head that way. And being across the bridge will add to that time. And of course, we've got, what, an additional 300 homes being built up there. So I don't know population-wise whether <coughs> Claxton would be bigger or that area up there. I'm not, like I said, I'm not too wild about moving it across the bridge. So the study uh, called for, uh, the Andersonville truck to move to I-75, so move closer into Clinton. Uh, the Clinton truck to move to South Clinton. So there was it wasn't just the the Clinton truck moving and, and Andersonville staying. It was it was pulling Andersonville a little bit closer into Clinton. Okay. Um, still having that Andersonville presence right there at I-75, but now having a quicker access up I-75 to Rocky Top. Um, and then being able to be right there at that I-75 area, not that we would station exactly in that spot, but um, somewhere close into that I-75 exit in Clinton. Okay, so the majority of the runs are during daylight hours. Yes, sir. And by having this 12-hour truck and just station it in the Claxton area, would be a tremendous help, right? Oh, it, it would definitely help countywide, but it would also help during Claxton. Now, I have not pinpointed what times Claxton's responses are. Um, even that one that was 14 minutes, it was at about 5.40 p.m., so it was still in that 8.88 p. time zone um, that we would have this truck that we were 
you know, push them forward. Uh, so, yeah, it would have a big portion. I mean, 82% of the times we go code white is from 8A to 8P. It, we're, we're just busier during the day. Uh, now, I, I want to, again, reemphasize, code white is based on the number of 911 paramedic staffed ambulances. So we do utilize our BLS convalescent ambulances for 911 calls, and they can still provide a lot of emergency care. So they can still help. The domino effect there is that means we do less convalescent calls. Now, convalescent, yeah. the, the convalescent system we have pays for itself and a little bit more. That's why we do convalescent, and it's another service we can provide to our community. But when our call volume in convalescent continues to stay lower than, than what we would like it to be, that means we bring in less revenue. And that's where we're at. We're using convalescent calls for 911 calls quite frequently because all the 911 trucks are on calls. We've had an elongated time for time on task, which is we look at how much time they spend on a call, that has increased over time. And although it may not seem like a big number, when you add that or multiply that by the number of calls that we do, it turns into days that we're taking longer on calls than we used to. So it's it just the, those resources that we had five years ago are now ha handling a, a higher call volume. That, that's, just, that's just kind of the, the status of it. And I get it. I mean, you all as, as, as a body have tremendous decisions to make, a tremendous accountability, and I, I, I don't, um, you know, I really don't want to be in your, your position, to be honest with you. But, uh, but it, it, it's a difficult decision to make. And there's a saying in EMS, when it comes to EMS, there's three options, good, fast, and cheap. You get to pick two. That's it. Can't have all three. And I believe this county has good and cheap. Okay. I think that's where we're at. What was the capital outlay for the... For a station? Uh, no, for the 12 hour. So you had asked, I didn't bring my budget documents because this is operations <laughs> committee. Um, <clears throat> I think the total deficit was like 550,000 total deficit budget because we took it, we had a maintenance person in there, we took that request out, that decreased it 60,000. Are you talking about the deficit with the additional trucks? He was asking how much it cost to put on that, that seven truck. So for, for personnel, you're probably looking at 250, 275,000 salary benefits included. We would use current fleet. We did not ask for any equipment. We would use current fleet, current equipment to, to get that ambulance oh, okay. up and going. Now, future, was, so in, in 20. I was going to ask the staff is 250, and then what was the capital? The capital, we're not, we did not ask for any capital. We would use current fleet, current equipment. Um, now, in the future, we would probably want to increase, so we carry 13 cardiac monitors, okay? So in the future, we may want to bump that up to 14 when we have to replace our cardiac monitors. But right now, I, don't, I do not believe we need to do that to get this up and going. And I don't believe we would need to do that in the, in the first two or three years. Thank you. Mayor, do you want to speak? Yeah, just a couple things. Um, Nathan also, in addition to overdoses, he also has plugged me into when we are code white. And it's staggering when you start seeing, that's obviously response in the community. That's not just, oh, you know, we're at Burger King, it's representative of a response. But I don't know if it would be helpful to you all, um, before Commissioner Denenberg became a commissioner, um, Nathan and I actually put together a um, kind of a learning event where we had a big white poster and we kind of walked the community, elected officials, um, and, and um, potential elected officials through our pay process. And at the end of the day, the issue, not with just Anderson County EMS, but all across the state of Tennessee, in fact, um, about two weeks ago, I got an email from the head of the Tennessee Ambulance Association. She was asking me, can the county mayor's association help with a survey of every single county? These are her words, crisis, we are in a pay crisis the revenues for EMS, the 
the payments we are receiving are not meeting the needs. Um, we're not getting the inflationary adjustments. Um, the number, and Nathan can speak to these numbers far better than I can, but fewer people are actually being transported. That is how, by law, the only way we can generate revenue from a Medicare or Medicaid. Um, we don't get paid on overdoses. There's a lot of medical work we do in the community that we don't get to bill for, or if we do bill, we're not getting paid. Does that mean it's worthless work? No, it's value, it's what we do. Um, but they're lost in translation a lot of times is that well, you are able to generate revenue, so you should be able to live off of revenue. And to Nathan's point, you know, you, you can pick two of the three. Yeah, we can, and, and, you know, but it may not be everything that we should be providing to the community. And I'll give you an example of, um, I was at a Homeland Security meeting recently with um, an individual from Knox County and they are going through a process like we went through with Fitch and Associates because of the issues there. So as an example, um, they were sharing with me that on Saturday, they only had six Saturday evening, you know, this was a, at my meeting, um, they only had six vehicles in service, six ambulances in service for all of Knox County on a Saturday night. Um, where their number of employees is 300, normally 350 to 400, they're in the low 200s. They are looking at um, a $1.5 million funding gap that they're going to have to address. And all of that, it's, again, coming back to what are we getting paid? And you can't just, and, and you all would hear about it from the, commission side of things, if we increase the rates for those that do pay, um, you're going to blow them through the roof and then you're going to hear as commissioners, um, you know, just that small percentage that, that are paying. So even insurance companies where that used to be kind of your, okay, we've got private insurance, those rates what we're getting paid on those, those numbers are now dropping as well. Um, it, Na again, Nathan can speak more to that. But I just, I, I guess, you know, when you look at EMS and if you look at your budget book, and I, I should have this number memorized and I don't, but if you look, you, County Commission has been extremely generous in the last few years on helping us obtain capital. And you see the direct impact in your community and we serve the entire community plus all the folks that work here and commute in, and we are enormously appreciative. So I, I wanna thank you, and when we've bought equipment up here, I mean, you just send um, so much good out in this community, and I wanna thank you for that. But I also do wanna point out, if you look at what you all subsidize our service in terms of operation, um, it's less than three pennies. And then even though budget kind of took this away this budget cycle, the majority of those pennies have actually been so that we could turn around and pay you back <laughs> for dispatch or fleet. And so the subsidy for Anderson County EMS is very small. And I just think that we're going to have to, if if the public views calling 911 that we are going to provide not transport response but medical response we need to look at what what is that value and how do we want to fix it and i have suggested i suggested this to robbie you know anderson county has been uh, the beneficiary of increased sales tax and maybe you know, there's a, a way to, to let some, you know, accrue to the schools, accrue to highway, and then maybe a portion starts accruing to EMS. 
that's a way to capture money, not just from the people that live here, but the people that are visiting here. I mean, maybe that's a way, but there needs to be some way to assist funding the service to the community. And um, that, that's the world we're living in. And I would encourage Nathan to address too, like how we even deal with a heart attack. It used to be, Commissioner McCamey knows, get them in there and get them to the hospital. And now they're on scene longer. They're doing the medical work on scene. They're stabilizing the patient. All that information is getting, you know, through equipment that you all have helped fund. It's getting to the hospitals um, right then uh, while we do the transport. A lot of advancements are taking place, and the community expects that. And it, it's just going to have to be a conversation we have at some point because um, something has to give in terms of the funding. It really does. I know it. In a prior administration, we were told as a commission that the ambulance service was making money hand over fist. And that never was true. No. It never made money. They put them in a separate uh, code on the, on the budget, uh, their own little private fund balance and all that. And it turned out that it didn't work. And I've said all along, it's not a business. It's a service, and that's what we're setting up here to do is to provide service to the community. And if we can't do that, then we need to step down. All I've got to say. Well, Mayor, our growth was 1.6 million. Is that correct or close? It, yes. Figuratively. Um, or, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, let me verify that number. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I, I think you're correct, okay. or 1.7. And out of that growth is, that's people moving in, yep. and that requires more services. So I think as we go forward, if we plan on our growth, uh, percentage-wise, goes to these different departments. I think, you know, the sheriff's budget requires like 1.3 uh, million uh, that, that was approved. So that, that leaves like, point, you know, Three, three hundred thousand left, something like that to spend, and then what he's wanting to do is hire employees. Which what he's telling us is he's cutting down on convalescent calls because he don't have the employees That's to right. run them where they're making money. So there's a return on investment right there by paying for those two employees. There's money coming back. So going forward, if if there's some type of formula that you look at that says you know this is our growth. And these are all the things that's in the county that contributes to the growth. Because you can start having all these, you know, got a lot of people moving in, but they require these services. And sure as, you know, you can't get an ambulance because it's cold white, that really affects you. You know, whether it's, you know, family or grandchildren or, you know, whoever. Uh, it's really important. So, but you know, there's th I, we still need to look at this again, and, and we can, yeah. like uh, Commissioner McCamey was saying. Well, that that's like with um, you know planning and development. As there's more growth and there's more permits and more inspections, more stormwater, you know, then where's the give? And so this year, Commission Budget Committee approved a full time codes officer, which you know that'll help pick up the slack there and there are times we do have to grow you know when we have natural growth in our community yeah mm -hmm. you don't want to grow out of grow when there's not really a need but when there is then yeah and um you know we have shared nathan and i've been we had a round table for instance um with jeremy biggs the head of methodist um steve clapp vice president of development for ut hospital Aaron Bradley, the director for East Tennessee Area uh, Aging and Disability. Uh, Commissioner Palmer was there. Commissioner Val, uh, representing the detention facility. Uh, Dr. Parrott, Nathan, who else? Am I missing anybody? Um, but, you know, our conversation, it was um, really we're all from all the various angles in perspectives seeing a lot of the same things in our community um, mental health being one of these major issues that 
EMS and the Sheriff's Department are struggling with because we don't have proper, you know, mental health facilities and all that's needed in that area. Um, EMS is seeing sicker people and we're hearing that just across the board, not just Anderson County EMS. This is not just people calling 911 for no reason. I mean, they are, whether it's COVID or something, they are sicker. Um, but anyhow, thank you for letting you know, me speak. You know, we predicted I won't. several years ago, we did a study to predict this growth and people said, you bumped your head. There's no way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's right there on the money. Yep. Now, if we didn't have this growth, where would we be? I mean, the, the sheriff's budget's much needed, you know, just like his budget and all that, but we just need to be real good stewards and make sure that anything's got a return on investment. I always say that. That's what we got to invest in. I appreciate so. a lot of your comments, and, and I'll hush and sit down. To your point on the facilities, I think it would be good. Um, you know, maybe you have a, a group that starts making decisions, but maybe operations could fill that role. And we could start by just, you know, it could take some time, but you all need to see the facilities. Well, and so like, for instance, um, Commissioner Mays, you spoke to the sheriffs, that one that we should graze down. Well, also you should see the EOC and then yeah. we could visit an an EMS headquarters because seeing makes a difference when we're up here just telling you oh we need this you know we're really needing this but when you all as commissioners can lay your eyes on it I think um, it will make a difference Back and if you want to do that we can start you know I could schedule something once a month yeah. I don't want to overburden we did you. that one it was 2017 2016 remember when Commissioner yes. Scott and some of the other commissioners went with you and yep. visited every uh, facility you have. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember Commissioner Scott for sure. <laughs> there were several. Thank yes, you, Mayor. I do, I do remember that, and we've had some others. But I would agree with Mayor Frank that, you know, seeing is different than, than seeing with your own eyes walking into and actually being in the same room is, is just different. And I, and I say that for all facilities. Um, that, that Commissioner Mays was referencing. And we're more than happy to, to take you to our facilities. I know Commissioner Yeager asks me all the time, and I'm Commissioner Yeager, not today. Can't he take you out to my facility? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But uh, we've, had, we've had those opportunities. I know there was another question you asked about if we added a, an additional 24-hour truck in Claxton, what would it cost? We have put that together, and we have um, presented that before, and I'm, I'm more than happy to... To say now, of course, obviously, I uh, have to look and, and see when I did that. Construction costs, I, I'd be, I know there are some educated guesses out there. Uh, we, we know roughly about the size, and, and we can do square foot cost. And, and I did put, again, I used that when I was looking at capital outlay, but we know how volatile that, that could be. Um, and to Commissioner so. McCain's point of not state having a station in Claxton, but uh, what would you say? Hosting. 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 Yeah. Hosting. If, if the, the school or, because I know the school owns property up to so far and the, and the fire department, even if we built something there, you know, on that piece of property to allow for your folks to, to post and that would have, that would get them out of the elements or anything like yes, that. Yes, sir. Just something. Um, you know something that would be a good facility not for just today but you know on yes, down the road but um i do have a quick question well are you talking about when they build the new school if they can incorporate something there in class well yeah i mean i think you know that's definitely worth discussing is you know what does it what does that area look like if they do move you know schools and um a question i do have and this is for educational purposes with the property taxes and sales tax, is it is it set by TCA on how much the schools get? Yeah, it is. Okay. Not the exact sum, but it's a formula. Right, and and I'm assuming the other things that may be divvied out. Like I know you talked, to, you know, when the county raised property taxes, I guess it was 
was it 19 or 18, where some pennies went to capital outlay or something like that. I just didn't know if there's anything in those formulas that commission has the authority to move around. That's outside my wheelhouse. So th that would be more of a Jay and Robbie question. Um, so that your schools are set, but your property tax, um, you know, you all can assign pennies where you want to. Um, like one of the one of the prohibitions. I mean, how do I phrase this? Um, like if you're if you shift a penny during your budget process, you can do that. So, for instance, if you wanted to give additional funds to EMS during the year, you cannot do that. You're taxing people for what was passed in that budget, yeah. that appropriation resolution, and those funds must go to that fund and you can't share. I mean, then there's all these rules about, you know, loaning and different things, inner fund and, and all of that that gets into heavier weeds. But you all can, um, that's, that's your, that's your primary duty is setting that tax rate and assigning those funds. The sales tax, um, you have um, a county portion, even with the schools. So the schools get um, the the schools get. I'll I'll use Rome County as an example. The county sales tax, the county portion, in Roan County, it goes to the schools, but they choose where it accrues. So they tell the school system, instead of just kind of a blank check for the sales tax, Dr. Parrott probably kill me for sharing this with you all, but. But like in Roan County, they, they say, okay, X, uh, X amount up until this dollar amount will accrue to cafeteria or transportation. And then the rest, you know, the schools can use for whatever. So they're trying to kind of keep a little more manage, ma management control over where those sale, sales tax dollars go. Anderson County, uh, like for instance, with highway, the rest accrues to highway and you know, a couple of years ago, I brought this idea and it was viewed more as an attack and it wasn't. I was saying give highway like a million and then anything that accrues over that, you know, use it for other things such as an EMS or maybe you want it to accrue to solid waste because they always have a funding issue. And yes, solid waste is a countywide enterprise and they're responsible for running the landfill but there's always this balance between what's countywide and then what's rural. And so you wanna, you don't wanna start property taxing your whole county, including the cities too much, you know, to outweigh the services that we're providing to a city. So, I mean, you always wanna be cautious of that as commissioners, you know, w when does it tip the balance uh, between city and county? But yeah, you all, I mean, there's a lot you could look at in how, you know, and there's priorities that you set by setting those pennies. To Commissioner McCamey's point, the EMS used to be in general fund. And um, so there it are benefits. Be, it ought to be there now. It, yeah, so <laughs> I mean. We're the only ones that don't have a maintenance of effort. Everybody else, the highway department, the sheriff's department, the schools, they all have maintenance of effort. Even the libraries. And then, yeah, <laughs> even the library. And then they turn Election around and we have no maintenance of effort, so we can just cut budgets and slash them, and that's where the cuts usually come from somewhere in, inside the general fund. Yeah, which is because just your, which is your really parts. your sliver of the entire budget. So what is it, about 20? 25 to 27, I don't know what we are right now, 27 million on the general fund side. So, and then that's all your fee officials and they're um, turning over their excess revenues. So, yeah. 
I mean, if there's any document that can be helpful to you all, if you want to see just maybe some high level stuff, you know, like on any of these things, I'm happy to bring it back. Anything else for Nathan? No, I'm not it from there. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Carry that figure around with you. <laughs> Next is a convenience center discussion about maybe putting some of those containers, the 30 yard containers, for I think the calls that most commissioners get, especially in the rural areas on a Saturday when everybody's going to dump their garbage and it's already full and they hadn't got them there yet. So I think we all got the same calls from the same people on one Saturday. And if to put a 30 yard container on there, I, I don't know if that'd be, be beyond our uh, contract, but you've got some local companies that can do those, <coughs> and it's like $50 a haul. So, you know, if you got four or five, if you got room to have four or five of those overflow, you know, just where they're gonna put their garbage. I mean, that's, that's a way to cut down on some of these calls because that's when people are sitting in, in line for 35 minutes and then they cut them off, you get the phone call. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, even if, of course, that would be more money to the solid waste budget, but for $250 a week, you know, I think that would be money well spent if you, you know, if you did five at, per site. It was quiet this weekend. I didn't. I think everything went okay. But I know we've got Memorial Day weekend and uh, the Fourth of July coming up, so we're going to have those holidays. And there's that's always when it picks up, and like it's going to rain this week, so everybody's going to wait till Saturday. So I don't know if we could approach uh, the contract we have right now, Waste Connections, and see if they could go ahead and just be ready with if, if they would add some thirty-yard containers. Well, I don't know if 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 what that would cost. I was just talking about maybe using the local, we got some local companies that right. do it. That, and I can tell you that I used the, the one company that we've got a contract with and it's four times the money than what the local contracts are. So, you know, it's, it's just a way to put some of the local uh, people that have businesses inside Anderson County, uh, give them some more revenue. But, Mayor. Well, you're sitting next to the chairman of the Solid Waste Committee, so I, I'm certain he will put that on the agenda and we can discuss that. And then also, just to let you know, we have um, the RFP posted for our disposal of land, you know, land or of waste into the landfill. One of the things we have in that RFP is hopefully to be able to discuss or negotiate hours for Saturday at the landfill. So one of the challenges we have at all of our convenience centers is there is a, uh, the landfill closes early on Saturday, meaning if we fill up, we have nowhere, you know, we can't, like during Monday through Friday, we can't empty a container and, and get one back. And so we're hopeful that maybe in this contract process, we can also negotiate that um, to give us more flexible hours on Saturday to provide some relief for the convenience centers. And maybe that means, you know, working with them, they close early on a Tuesday or, you know, I, I don't know, um, but we're hopeful that we can have that conversation because Saturday is a, is a big day. I mean, it really is. We've had, uh, I've been monitoring the one at uh, East Wolf Valley and three times this week, they only had one open. And I was like the fourth in line at one time. And I talked with Jeff about it, and he said that he's advised them time and time again to have two open at all times. And the same thing should be happening at Glen Alpine. And we don't have that luxury at Green Valley or Bryceville or Frost Bottom or Marlow, but we do have it at the two busiest ones, and that's Glen Alpine and and uh, over here. So we're we're working with Waste Connections to make sure that we get one. At, even if one got filled up on a Saturday, the second one should be empty and sitting there ready to go. And uh, 
we're we're good talking with them and Jeff's getting with them. But I he asked me to monitor this one over here and I've been doing that. I went out four times this week so or last week and uh, it uh, like I said three three out of the four times that I was there last week we only had the one open and there's another one sitting there that just got a closed sign on it and he said it's supposed to have an open sign so that's that's our biggest problem is that we wait till that one gets full and then when we do open the other one it gets filled up too quick and they can't come and empty it before noon before on a Saturday before the landfill closed they can't empty that full one you know so we're going to have to get those emptied on Friday sometime during the day on Friday so that we've actually got two open on each Saturday at those two and that's what we're working for. The Solid Waste Committee is also working on um, upping the game on recycling, and so May 16th, any commissioner or Solid Waste Board member that wants to go, we're going to go to Sevier, Sevier County and see their facility because um, they just blow it out in terms of uh, minimal into the landfill. But the other thing is, Jeff and I talked about once we get through this landfill contract, you know, there are, there are counties in this state that don't have convenience centers, that they, you know, they have curbside or, you know, do we ever get there? I don't know, but I, I do think there are ways that we can just really do better, and I think it starts with an assessment um, and maybe what some of these other counties are doing and how can we move away from convenience centers because they're not truly always convenient if you're having to <laughs> to drive and, and take your trash off and so um, I'm sure you all would love for it to be a topic to move away from you as well so um, let us you know we're gonna be working on the recycling let us get through you'll you'll get the landfill contract and um, then maybe we can start working on that too and doing some more positive, progressive, how can we do a better job of how we address waste? Is there anything else come before this committee? Can I make an announcement? Sure. Oh, yeah. It's a renaissance run time. If uh, you're not familiar with it, this is the Norris Community Foundation's uh, major fundraiser and uh, all the all the money that they'll raise this weekend stays in the community they do a lot of grants for uh, a lot of the elementary schools won grants last year for playground equipment picnic tables stuff like that but you can register at the Norris Pavilion at 8 a.m. and the race starts at 9 a.m. I signed up but I'm not running <laughs> yeah there, there's a virtual, virtual option you can you can follow the trail on online somehow if you want to that's what I did <laughs> Is it tough? No, my time gets better every year. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned the shortcuts. <laughs> Stephanie, you got anything? Okay. All right, seeing that, we'll call this adjourned. Thank you very much.